Okay, I think uh, just so so you all know, um, I think the staff are going to mute during the presentation. So if you have a question, feel free to type it out. And I believe also that uh, we're recording. Yes, we're recording. So uh, if you need a repeat or something, just know that in about five business days, we'll have this up on the YouTube channel so that you can review it. Uh, but you're more than welcome to ask questions in the chat. And I believe at the end of every section, we we pause and we have uh, time for audio chat as well. Do note that you'll have to go in and unmute yourself in order to ask verbal questions, or you're welcome to um, type out a question. There's there's several of the RMS staff uh, that will be monitoring the chat as well. All right, so I believe we've got uh, we've got we've got scheduled a couple hours. So what we'll do is we'll try to get through this in about an hour and a half or so. And uh, so if I go too fast, you can either ask me to slow down or you know have a question for the end of the section, and we can talk about it then. Yeah, we should be good to go. All right. Now I just have to figure out how to remove all the stuff from my screen. All right, there we go. So goal of this training is just to kind of go over a uh, it's, it's kind of an overview of RMS and it's from a bit more of an advanced uh, perspective. So we had a beginner's training yesterday where we went over some of the daily reports, some of the functions that uh, that we had inside of contracts, um, you know, some of the basic operations, I guess you could say on a day to day. Uh, you know, say if you were an RE or somebody working in RMS on a on a daily basis, what it would look like. So today we're going to be talking more about uh, contract setup, what it involves in the um, the, the the menus, uh, whether it be the local office, district office, what it looks like inside the contract setup. We'll also be talking about uh, you know the line items, the contract line items, finances, what it looks like to do a modification. Uh, we'll also talk a little bit about schedules and the import export and a little bit on the closeout as well. Again, this is kind of like an overview. So we'll try to get through this as quick as possible so that you guys will have time for questions at the end. All right, first things first, uh, when you start up RMS, the default screen that you get will have a list of all the contracts in your office. So uh, once once you open up those contracts, uh, you know, you'll, you can you can view everything that's inside of the contract. First, though, outside of that, you have the menu options at the top. So very at the very top, you have local office, district office, district library, system library, the summary reports, your settings, your whether or not you have the mobile access and staff. So um, right now we're looking at the local office. So inside of RMS, there's kind of a hierarchy, right? You've got your contracts, which are at the very bottom. You've got your offices, then you've got the district and it kind of goes in that tree, right? So you got the, the district, say Los Angeles district, you can have a resident office underneath that, underneath that resident office, you can have additional offices if you want to, it's kind of like a tree view uh, and that can actually branch out as far as you want. And inside of those offices, you can have contracts assigned to every single one. And we allow you to go in and set uh, specific settings for each one of these offices. Um, uh, when it comes to that specific office, because we know every single office has different contracts that they deal with, as well as different people that run them and everything like that. So just keep in mind when you do go to this uh, screen, uh, what you select is what you'll get. So right now the selection is on the district. If you want to select a specific office to deal with those settings, you'll have to click on that office and go to it. Uh, this is what it looks like when you go into the office description. Uh, so, so we had that uh, selection at the top bar there. Uh, right now, you can set, you know, you can set uh, the office manager, you can set address. Um, by the way, setting the office manager helps us a lot, too, because say we want to go in and see who, say an RE calls us up at the RMS Support Center, puts in a ticket, they have a question, and it's a policy question, right? It allows us here at the RMS Support Center to open up your your office, your specific office, to see who the office manager is. So we can point them to that direction. You'd be surprised. We get quite a few questions that deal with uh, policy questions. And I'm sure all of you know, uh, being advanced users at ER, even if you're not, no worries, that, that the blue bars there on the um, uh, are, are lookups, right? So if I click on Han Solo here, it's going to come up with a list of all the office managers for uh, for this office that I can select from the RMS staff, right? Right, and again, uh, you know, if you have questions on what to set for uh, the, these screens, a lot of the responses that you're going to be getting from us, you know, it's going to be defer to your local office policy. Why is that? Because 
every office has its own policies, its own procedures, its own way of doing business. And yes, there are standards when it comes to the Army Corps of Engineers, but due to the complexity of the contracts that are in RMS, every office does things a little bit differently. You know, you've got dredging offices, you've got services contracts, you've got, you know, I, I don't need to tell you guys this because you know all this, but that that kind of dictates the policies. So if you're a brand new if you're a brand new government user and you're coming in asking, you know, what do I do? A lot of times we'll say it depends on your district because every district does things a little bit differently. For example, right here, uh, one of the office policies that you can set for this specific office is whether or not your uh, your quality assurance representatives can go and change data in the past. So, for example, right here, I can set a policy for this specific office. I will allow you to set. Uh, I'll allow you to go back and change completed daily reports so many days in the past, or I will not allow that to happen. So some some districts will allow you, some offices allow you to go in and change daily reports for the past, um, and others do not. Uh, and, and by the way, when you do select that uh, daily reports created within X days, it allows you to put a date in there. So you can say 10 days, 20 days, 30 days. Uh, and what that does is every single contract that's in this specific office, if I complete out a, a daily report, I can go back those many days and change that daily report. Um, I think, I think most dif districts have that set, so you can only uncomplete the most uh, recent daily report. All right. Um, we also have a space for specific office documents. Um, this this isn't a, a, a widely used area of RMS, so th this is kind of a collection for templates or policies or anything that you kind of want to store that is accessible by um, by this area. Now, just to kind of go back again to get to this screen and when you're at the selection screen in RMS, you're going to choose local office on the top right hand corner. If you're not an office administrator, you're not a district administrator, you're not a system administrator, you will not be able to access this area of RMS. So if you're if you're a, you know, a representative that goes out to the field and does quality assurance, or, you know, you're a COR and you don't necessarily have those permissions, these screens aren't going to look familiar to you and you won't be able to access them. So you have to have uh, local or you have to have office administrator or district administrative permissions to get to these screens. Uh, so, so this area right here is, is just a, you know, in RMS3, we have the document packages, right? So the document packages allow you to drag and drop a ton of documents into RMS. Um, uh, you know, some of you that have, have larger contracts know that we're kind of dealing with that uh, RMS dealing with, you know, tens of thousands of files in these document packages. So here you can add um, document packages to the office level and have that stored at the office level. So any of the office administrators and above can can um, access that. What do you store in here? Whatever you want. And again, defer to your local office policy. Uh, here's another screen where you can set the mod routing slip. So again, we're talking about the local office and modules underneath the uh, local office modules uh, here. This has to do with modifications. Uh, some of the stuff that will get put onto some of the reports generated by contracts in the local office. Um, again, what do you put in here? It, it depends. It varies from district to district. Uh, it, it definitely defer to your local policy on, on that one. All right, so this screen right here is the interface schedule. Uh, one of the things that some of you who have used RMS in the past with 2.38, uh, you, you were able to go into 2.38 and um, and see th there's batch processes that run in the background of RMS that sync up P2 and CFMS. Uh, and, and that's different for every single district. The reason why we do this is so that if one district has a lot of data, it doesn't necessarily impact the other districts. But that also means that you're not going to get an immediate sync with CFOMS or P2 unless you, with CFOMS, choose to do a CFOMS download right away. We'll get to that uh, in the future, or in the near future. Same thing with P2. Um, that that imp, that data connection does not happen instantly, right? There's a batch process that goes through and waits until this specific time to go and download from P2 for all the contracts in this in in this uh, office. Okay. Same thing with CFOMS. Uh, you'll notice that CFOMS, it's not instant unless you hit that download button to do it instantly. There's a batch process that runs in the background that will eventually sync it up. Um, with 2.38, obviously it was a bit different. Uh, we don't necessarily need to talk about 2.38, but um, with 3.0, we try to automate everything. Everything kind of runs in the background. And because everything's on CoreNet, uh, that allows that interface between RMS, P2, CFOMS, and a variety of, of other AIS systems. 
All right, so these are the office user entries. These are these are important for those of you that deal with word templates and macros. Uh, they allow you to pull this information off onto uh, these macros that you use for your local uh, office or contracts in your local office, right? So, so say I have an office in the middle of somewhere who does a lot of dredging. I can add these letterheads that involve this specific office and create a whole bunch of word templates that pull these these addresses off. So I don't have to pop these addresses in, you know, 50 different documents on a on a on a monthly basis, right? So uh, again, uh, those of you that are just joining, or uh, those of you that uh, don't aren't familiar with this, you have to be an office administrator, district administrator, or a system administrator to deal with this stuff. And a lot of this stuff is set mostly for word templates so if your district doesn't do any word templates which you know there's there's not a lot of them that do uh there, there are some that do uh but there are some that don't uh it, it all depends on your local office policy so uh, and again this is usually for macros word templates and stuff like that Alrighty. um so this right here are the local office milestones uh those of you that are you know that you've worked with contracts in rms know that Kind of what the what's the backbone of your contract are the milestone dates, right? So you have your notice to proceed, you've got your contract start date, you got your contract end date, you got your duration for your contract, and all those dates kind of dictate what you can do in RMS when it comes to your contract, right? These milestones vary, you know, very they vary a lot when it comes to one office to a different office, and you'd be surprised in how it differs from district to district. So districts like to have their own milestones and their own um, required, uh, uh, di you know, I, I, yeah, milestones when it comes to specific contracts, right? Now I think the screen, um, it it just shows. I know it does. It shows system as well. So you won't be able to modify or change the system milestones, but it shows them there just just so you know. Um, all right. So these these milestones are only for this local office. So do note that as a, an office administrator, if you go in here and you make some changes to this, you add in a milestone that you want on all the contracts in this office. It's only for that specific office. All right, and you'll note too uh, that there is an unarchived contract list for the office as well as for the district. The, there's a reason for that um, because there are certain. Uh, Offices that we didn't office administrators that districts did not want to have access to all of the offices, just that own office, right? So, again, you can have your district and you can have, say, 40 different offices underneath that district. And under those 40 offices, you can have resident offices under that as well and site offices and all that stuff, right? So, in RMS, we have, we allow you to, uh, to see archived contracts within specific offices only. Uh, there's also another one in the district level that I'll, that you can see all the archived contracts in the entire district, right? So, keep in mind this is a local office view only, not the district, right? And and whatnot. All right. Oh, uh, also to keep to let you guys know, that there's it, it may not be very apparent, but at the top left hand corner, there's the archive a contract unarchived contract and export contract files. This is, these are buttons. It, it may not be very apparent, but they're buttons. You can click on them. So I can select four or five different contracts here and I can choose, I want to archive all of those in one go. I can also unarchive them all in one go and then export the contract files out. Now, keep, keep in mind as, as RMS progresses and more and more files are stored inside of RMS, exporting those contract files can take some time. Uh, we were dealing with some very large contracts over the last few weeks uh, with a with a change to the daily reports area. Uh, we, we noticed that some of these contracts are on the tune of terabytes in size. So if you if you go and you export a contract file, uh, all the contract files for a contract that's a terabyte, that can take a long time. So keep that in mind when you go to export out. Obviously, there's there's really no indication to to size on on the screen yet. But you know, assuming you're you 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 deal with something like that, you definitely feel free to put in an RMS support ticket. We can help you out with that if you're having problems, but um, it's definitely dependent on the cores network. All right, P2 projects. Uh, again, those of you that have used 2.38 in the past, it was a quite a bit of a different process dealing with P2 projects and, and initiating a, a manual link and all that. With RMS 3.0, everything's kind of 
automatic in the background and a batch process. And, and it's been that way since 2016. So uh, this, this module is kind of on the forever under construction, especially with some of the changes done to P2 recently. Um, I know that there's been some issues with um, how RMS connects to P2, pulls data down from P2. Uh, James, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but we are working with P2 on that to mitigate those issues and get that back um, on, on back to where it was. <laughs> but anyway, the, just so you guys know, the reason why this is under construction is because RMS 3.0, there's a batch process that makes sure all that syncs up. Uh, you guys don't need to sit here and manually do it. I, I, it has been a feature to add that manual back, and that's definitely under consideration. But right now we're working on re-interfacing with P2 and fixing um, uh, some of the problems there, some of the changes that happened. All right, moving on. Again, if you guys have questions, uh, those of you that have just joined, feel free to uh, feel free to type your question in the chat. Uh, at the end of this section, we're actually going to pause and you can unmute yourself and, and ask questions. Um, the RMS staff is keeping an eye on the chat, so please feel free to type in as many questions as you'd like and they will reply. Uh, right now on my computer, I have a big PowerPoint uh, view on my screen, so I, I can't see anything except that PowerPoint. So if anyone's talking to me, I, I won't be able to see it. All right, so uh, we move from local office to district office. Uh, again, uh, you know, you have you have your contracts. Your contracts are in offices. Offices are in districts, and district is kind of the top level collection of uh, a hierarchy, I guess you could say, of what is inside of RMS. So you have your district office, which is the highest most collection when it comes to um, uh, contracts. I guess you could say Dis district office is the highest. Again. To get access to this view, you have to be a district administrator. On the left hand side, if I was a district administrator, I could get into local office and see everything inside a local office. If I'm a local office administrator, obviously I'm not going to be able to open up district office, district library, or anything like that. Um, and so inside of district office, we have sub modules inside there that allow us to set information, uh, titles, user roles, district policy, prime contractors, the you know, the placement. Um, and if we do dredging, there's there's dredges that we can set. And again, we talked about this already, the archived contracts um, that are available district district wide, not just for that specific office. Okay, so opening up the district office screen, okay, it's very similar to the um, the office screen. Uh, it, it's, it's just, it's the highest most uh, collection, right? So keeping this information up to date helps us a lot as well as um, you know, your, your uh, administrators, because we get a lot of questions come into RMS that deal with policy and whatnot. So we can, we can refer them to, you know, say, say there's an office administrator that has a district uh, uh, question. We can refer them to these guys. Um, also, I, I should also let you guys know too, that the, uh, that the office type is, is very important. I didn't really mention that before, but the office type, when you, when you set the office type, this is back if we were on the office screen, if you set that to training, the, the, what's real great about that is all the contracts inside that training offices don't get pulled for the summary placement reports. So I can go in and I can create a training office inside of my district where I can throw thousands of training contracts, let people play around with them, mess around with them, get to know RMS, put $700 million on a contract, and it's not going to affect my placement reports for the district. So that's that's also something that's real handy when it comes to a training office, for example, uh, or whatnot. There's definitely different types of offices there that you can you can deal with, but the the training office is is something that a lot of people don't know about. You know, I, we get a lot of new government users saying, you know, well, how do I how do I know how to learn RMS? Because I'm I'm afraid of you know messing anything up, uh, you know, messing everything up. So training offices are great. A lot of districts have them. Uh, definitely something to use. Okay, again, position titles. This is uh, th these are. Uh, uh, I think these are either signature positions or they're for the contract, um, the contract personnel that you can set for every single uh, contract. James, correct me if I'm wrong. I th this is this is just stuff that you can set and it involves just the district. Right, right. Contract user roles. Here is where you're going to set your permissions. Uh, contract user roles are a very powerful, very 
<laughs> very powerful way of setting up user roles inside of RMS permissions. So I can go in and I can set up a, a, a user role that allows me to access certain parts of RMS, give it a name and assign it to a whole bunch of staff, or I can go and assign it to contracts. Um, it, RMS has a, um, has, has a very powerful ability to go in and, and, and divvy up what people can access. You can go to every single module and you can set up read only, uh, you can set up read write, um, and, and you can mass sign that out to, um, to permissions. Every district does it quite a little bit differently. And what, what we've added recently uh, is the linked staff so that you can see what staff are assigned to user roles. Uh, so you don't have to go all the way back to RMS staff and see, all right, how many people are assigned to this user role? Because you couldn't do that before. So now you can click on that link to staff and, and see who's assigned to what user role. Um, so this is good, say, if you had a trainee and, uh, you know, somebody who is an intern, uh, you know, from the local college or whatnot, you can set up a user role where they can only access maybe the daily reports. Everything else will have no access. And then you can go in and assign those people to specific contracts for this user role. Um, all right, here are the district policies. Uh, these are, again, we get a lot of questions on, on some of this stuff. You know, how do I set this? What, what, what do I set here? Uh, this is very different for every single, um, every single district. Every single district does it a little bit differently. Uh, these these policies are very important because they change how contracts are operated, or or reports are run, or, um, or or how how processes are done on a contract level. So it's very important not to go in here and just change these things without knowing one what you're doing and two knowing the consequences to what you're doing. Um, so some of these policies are are they have pretty big consequences when they're changed. So yeah, again, people in the district level, they usually know a lot more about RMS than uh, than most people. That's why they have the district admin per, you know, permissions. So I don't really need to spend too much time on this one other than every district does it differently. If you're asking what to put in here, usually we tell you, you know, hey, it, it depends on your district. It's not something that we can tell you, but we, we can definitely help you. If you, you have a question, you're like, well, what will happen if I do this? feel free to put in a ticket with RMS, uh, the RMS Support Center. We'd be glad to help you out with that one. Again, this is the mod policies. Uh, these are the modifications, what happens, how many you know, days they're due. Uh, you know, say you know, for your specific district, there was a policy put in place where proposals have to be due so many days after requested. You can check those boxes to require them and whatnot. Uh, you can also check some districts require certain signatures on certain parts. Uh, other districts don't do anything, you know, where, with this. Uh, so it, it's definitely it's a, it's a district. That, by the way, doing this on the district level does it for every contract in your district. So again, the the consequences for changing this data are are widespread throughout all the contracts in that district. And the districts these days have quite a few contracts. So th these are these are big changes. Um, same here for the submittal policies, right? So you go in here and you can set a review policy, you know, on, on certain types of submittals, if they're FIO, GA, or whatnot. Uh, you can go in here and set, all right, how many copies do they have to have printed out, if they even do that anymore today, right? Because almost everything's electronic today. Um, you know, back in the day when I started, yeah, I remember them saying they had filing cabinets full of the, it was, it was back then, seven copies of all the, uh, you know, transmittals and, and whatnot. Uh, but this allows you to set policies so that when I go and create a transmittal in a contract, it defaults to those number of days, right? So that makes it real handy for if I was in a contract underneath this district, everything conforms to a rule of law, and that's where this is set. All right, the prime contractor screen. This is very important. Why is this important? Because this is how the contractor accesses contractor mode. Uh, the very first thing that I have to do, say I had a brand new district and say it was stood up in the middle of somewhere, right? And I had contracts that I had to award out to contractors. The very first thing I have to do is go in here and add prime contractors to the list of prime contractors. <laughs> it goes without saying, right? So, uh, and I have to fill out all their information. Once I fill out all their information, I can go in and assign a prime contractor to a contract. Then the next step is I have to assign staff to that prime contractor. And that allows a contractor to install contractor mode. Once they install contractor mode, 
they go in and they'll be able to access all the contracts assigned to the prime. So I can have a prime with 30, 40 contracts. I can also have a prime with uh, 40, 50 staff. Um, and all that is kind of managed here. Now you'll notice that there's the DUNS column. Uh, we're working on a change to RMS right now to replace that DUNS column with the UEI. Uh, and that is being tested by, that's the next release, exactly. So that will be tested by, um, uh, that's being that's being tested by UAT right now on the government side. So this column right here will be UEI, and the UEI will be blank at the at the beginning. You'll go in and you'll populate that if you want to. It's not going to change anything. It's just kind of a field that represents that contractor. It will also be updated on reports, lookups, and uh, the CPAR stuff. So the the next release will have uh, the change to UEI. Uh, it should also be noted too that every contract when we were asked to um, to put the prime contractor information in, every contract is a little bit different. So you'll notice there's a copy button to copy the information here to the contract when it comes to the office location, the, the UEI, the DUNS number, and all that stuff. So we're working on uh, on uh, help videos. We'll have a very detailed release notes with information on all that. Um, there will be a lot of training as well as a video on that. So we'll we'll do what we can to make that as painless as possible. All right. I think I need to go a little bit faster. So tell me to slow down if I'm going too fast. This this is the district baselines. Um, you can you can generate uh, placement reports, I believe, uh, and and you you can open this up and you have a lot of uh, ability to say, uh, you know. When this is due, what it what it what it pulls the amount from, and it's it gets real complicated. Again, if you're asking us what do you what do you do on this one, we can tell you what will happen if you do it. But as far as your policy, that's usually a district per district uh, thing. All right, dredge names. Uh, when we when we implemented dredging inside of RMS, um, there it was noted that uh, a lot of the dredges are the same from contract to contract. So it got real cumbersome to go in and um, and and add a, a dredge for every single contract in in the uh, district. So we allowed them. We allowed a, a district level dredge, so you can pull that down and and just use that one dredge, and it makes it real handy for reporting because I can pull a report for say the enterprise dredge and get all the data of all the all the contracts that it, it deals with in, inside that district. Um, yeah. All right. And again, we have the unarchived list uh, for the district level. Again, this is going to be a lot bigger than the office level, right? Because the office level is only contracts in the specific office, whereas the district it is all of the contracts in the district. And again, be very careful on how you're archiving and unarchiving and exporting out contract files, especially if the contracts are recent, because some of these contracts are very large and it can take a lot of time to pull that data out. So if you're in doubt, please feel free to put in a ticket with the RMS Support Center. We be very happy to help out and uh, let you let you know if this contract's big or how long it could take, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, I'm sure the CCB and whatnot will will have future changes to RMS that deal with that. But if it's an old contract, a lot of those contracts are real tiny, especially if they don't have any old, a contra, uh, attachments, right? And it's real quick to multi-select multiple of those and export those out or unarchive or export those specific files out. Alrighty. Right, right, the system library. What is the system library? The system library are values that we here at the RMS Support Center put into RMS. Uh, these are values that, that the users cannot change, even if you're a, a district administrator. Uh, these are these usually come from official. I don't know how to say this, but they're basically from official lists, right? Inside of the Army Corps of Engineers, whether it be uh, DOD level or specific agency level or whatnot. These have to be updated by here us at the RMS Appointment Center. So uh, sometimes we'll get requests from uh, you know from districts. Hey, uh, we need this specific reason code or you know this agency code, and they have to contact us, and we'll, we'll add that. Again, everything in here is uh, system level. Uh, is RMS only. We we had a request a while ago for the uh, for an asset store because uh, district administrators were working together on on kind of the same stuff, right? So you'd have You'd have, for example, John Stevens in Baltimore district doing a whole bunch of stuff that district administrator in another district was like, wow, that'd be great if I had that in my district. So here you can share specific, um, you know, templates, 
uh, you know, you know, whether it be district library stuff like standard text. Hey, this user role looks really great. Instead of me sitting here and, and programming it up myself, I can just copy it over to my district. Uh, same for queries. When I do custom reports, some of these queries that these districts are doing are absolutely amazing. A lot of time and effort was put into that. So district A will beg district B, hey, can I get a copy of that? Save a whole bunch of time and money and copy that query over so I can run that same um, custom report without having to put all the same time in that district you know, A put into it. So here you can go in here and share stuff between district administrators. Again, you have to be a district administrator in order to access the screen. Uh, but um, anyway, yep. So the, uh, it's a great way to share uh, between the district administrators themselves, especially when you have people like uh, you know. Uh, I, I pick on John Stevens because he's he's uh, the forefront on this list and he's very active in RMS. So he's got a ton of stuff in there that you, know, you can copy and, and pull into your own district. It saves a lot of time. It's really cool. All right. Uh, fun types again at the system level. Um, uh, uh, you as a district administrator, if you're a district administrator working in RMS, you have the ability of saying, yes, I'll include this on our lookups, those blue bars for my contracts in, in this district. Or I, I don't, my district doesn't do any uh, contracts with the Navy, so I'm not going to include that in my lookup, right? So you can check that, uncheck that if you want to. Same thing for the program types. I'm going to go through here kind of quick. Again, these can only be updated from the RMS support center. Uh, so if you're looking at this list and you're like, wow, this list hasn't been updated in a while, please put in a ticket, contact us at the RMS Support Center, uh, and we can update that. Status codes, same thing. Again, um, it's only something that we can update here. These 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 are values that contracts in the dis uh, inside the district pull from. Delay codes, again, same thing. And modification reason reason codes, same thing here. These are system level. Uh, every every district inside of RMS pulls from these, and uh, you'll notice that we have some of the COVID um, reason codes in there as well. Those were added fairly recently. Um, uh, to get to get changes from this, usually they come from headquarters. So when we get, for example, when we got the request to do a COVID uh, reason code for contracts that came from headquarters, so um, all right. <clears throat> Here are the, uh, the FAR references, again, not much to say other than system level. Same thing for the agency codes, kind of just showing you what it looks like, so, you know, especially those of you that haven't been inside of district library or before. Uh, here are the, those of you that have done submittals and transmittals, you'll, you'll, this is real familiar. These are the spec sections for the libraries that you can pull from when creating submittal registers. Uh, the, these lists are located here. So when you go and add a spec section and you want to pull from uh, either the 2014, 04, 95 uh, master format list, they, they all come from here. All right, and here are the uh, the, the P squared plan units. Um, again, these are not something that you can change. They need to be changed. That will be something that you have to um, you have to contact the RMS support center about. Usually, it comes from headquarters. So. Uh, same thing here, the, the um, real property stuff, the 1354 transfer and all that stuff is all located here. And we, we get quite a few requests to update these. Um, uh, and we've done them fairly recently, I believe, James. That was, that was not too long ago. But yeah, anyway. Um, all right. Going on. All right. These are the RMS reports. Um, we use a reporting tool. We updated that reporting tool fairly recently. Uh, and in here are the, um, the, the reports inside of RMS. You'll notice the report type, uh, obviously D stands for district, C stands for contract level. So if I open up a contract and I go to the contract level reports, all the C's will appear. If I go to the summary reports, all the D's will appear in, in, in inside of here. Um, uh, uh, again, this is stuff that only the RMS support center can edit and, and change. All right, moving on, moving on, query definitions. Here are the uh, the queries. So th these are these are SQL statements that you can you can use RMS three to run queries on the database, right? Um, the, some of the older RMS administrators will remember that we used to have um, there was there were other ways to connect to the RMS database back in the two point three eight days. With RMS three zero, I can run in a, a query to pull specific um, information directly from the database uh, at a SQL level, so that I can dump it into a report, right? And it makes it real easy. 
to go in here and, and pop out some of these queries. Like, for example, John, John Stevens, he, he, he has quite a few, um, queries that he uses to populate reports or just, just to even dump the data on a screen so that you can export that screen out. You'll notice on the top right hand corner of this query definition screen, there's an, there's an export option. Every single screen inside of RMS that's a data screen, I can click that export and dump it out to Excel, right? And that makes it handy if I'm doing stuff outside of RMS that needs that data, right? Uh, some districts have their own reporting, some districts have their own whatever it is that they need to put data into. These queries make it easy for that to happen. Yep. Um, all right, moving on. All right, these are the, um, again, at the system level, most of, most of you, you won't be dealing with this. This is kind of at the RMS level. This is when the batch process that runs behind RMS to sync up CFOMS with RMS and when that happens uh, on, on a per district level. So if you get, you've got the district EROC codes on the left there and, and when the batch process happens. This is kind of handy for uh, system administrators or even a district administrator that's wondering for XYZ district, when, when will the batch process happen? Because I'm waiting for this payment to go through and I need it to happen now. Obviously we've got this download CFOMS now button and all that stuff, so. All righty. All right, summary reports. These summary reports are uh, are at the district level. So if I go and I run this report, it's going to pull all the data for all the contracts inside of RMS. I can limit that specific summary report to specific contracts or offices. Uh, or if the report has options like, you know, only on this date or whatnot. These reports are very sensitive because they involve all of the um, all of the reports run at the district level, and usually uh, they're they're uh, financial, right? So those of you that have non-cat card users, say they're you know uh, foreign um, foreign citizens using RMS to go to a job site and they don't have a cat card, a lot of these reports are not accessible by anyone without a cat card. Um, uh, also, custom reports show up in this list. So if I have a district who has a very active RMS administrator, such as Baltimore, and they've got a lot of custom reports, those reports will show up in this list. Meaning if John Stevens go in and he creates a custom report that's really awesome, uh, I, if I have access to summary reports, I can run that without having to bug him. Double click on that report, generate all that data, save it out, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, I apologize for picking on one. There's there's a lot of great RMS administrators out there and a lot of great customer reports and a lot of districts. All right. This is the GIS screen. Um, yeah, not much to say about this other than, uh, you know, you click on the screen, you can, you can sort it via contracts or offices on the top right-hand corner. There's the radio buttons there, keep that in mind. Uh, the, uh, there, there's a lot of high level data that you can pull here. Um, and it's, it's kind of in, in limbo. I'm not going to go into a long story cause I'm, I'm falling behind on the slides. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll let you guys ask questions if you have any questions on this, but, uh, we don't get too many questions on this. Um, all right. User settings. What is, what are user settings? User settings have to do with your local RMS client. So again, it's not really at the district level or contract level. This has to do with the RMS that's sitting in front of you. I believe the next slide has more info. So if, if I'm running it on a government computer that doesn't have any hard drive space, I can uncheck that limited cache box and I can limit cache size to a certain size. Now, why does this matter? Uh, people, uh, I'll pick on John Stevens again, I apologize. So people like John Stevens, they open up dozens and dozens of contracts on a daily basis. What does that mean? their cache on their RMS folder is going to be massive. I mean, in the tens of gigabytes, if not more, right? So if I have a government computer that's limited, I can limit that cache size so I don't constantly run out of space, right? So I don't have to go into the RMS data folder and delete it all the time. Uh, I can also check certain boxes. Uh, for example, user preferences in 2.3, it was real popular to for district administrators. I, I, I have to open up 10 different contracts and I don't want to have to go to administration, to correspondence on every single one of those you know, 10 contracts. You can check a box that says, the last open submodule that I was in will open up on the next contract I open up. Uh, and, and a lot of the RMS administrators, uh, this, this is something they use all the time, right? Uh, for myself, if I'm testing something and I wanna test it in five different contracts, I don't wanna have to open up daily reports. I don't wanna have to go here, go there. It will save the last place that I was in and next contract I open up, boom, it goes right there. Of course, if you only work in one contract, you probably don't want that. Um, 
just, just so you guys know too, we're working on a DLL list with the government when it comes to updates and new email lists. Uh, those of you that got the notice for this training, we've been working with um, CEIT and uh, CIO, sorry, and and uh, our PMO to come up with a government approved DLL list to get information out to y'all. And it's a lot more difficult than we uh, we expected because CEI, CIO has a lot of limitations on 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 com communication inside of uh, Coronet and all that. But anyway, long story short, that that box right there, it's for the future. That's um, it, if you want if you want to be notified, checking that box helps us because in the Oracle database, it'll have that checkbox next to your name, and then we can know whether or not we can bug you. Uh, but right now, that that's just uh, for future use. Um, same thing for the RMS application update policy. That right there, I'm not even sure if you'll see that unless you're a developer. Um, but don't don't worry about that. Again, cache size almost always leave that unlimited if you can. Those of us that uh, use RMS and open up a lot of contracts, um, that that cache size can be an issue. RMS Mobile, we had a, a mobile application a while ago um, on a few contracts ago uh, that was put on hold. Um, that I don't know if you can even download those anymore uh, or set them up anymore. But that that tools has been um, retired and. Uh, that's all I can say about that. All right, and RMS staff, same thing here. Um, RMS staff, this has to deal with all the people inside the contract or inside the district that access this district. Uh, we get we get a lot of questions sometimes on procedures here. Again, every district has its own set of procedures. Um, for example, what should I put for the RMS ID? Doesn't really matter. You can put whatever you want. Uh, most districts usually will have, for example, this Baltimore district. They will have E1. Something, 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 and then the um, uh, you know initials for the person, right? Uh, but it, it could be whatever you want. It could be test. It could be hello. It could be whatever you want. Um, uh, we we've been asked not to delete any of the staff. So when you right click and you delete, what it does is it basically sets them as inactive and um, and hides them, right? Because they're they they could be linked to signatures. They could be linked to actions and contracts. So we cannot delete staff. We have to either inactivate them. Or, um, or or set them up for or for contracts, right? Inside of here, when you double click, that's where you set up user roles for that person as well. Not sure if the next screen. No. So uh, some of the some of the common questions we get on you know user um, on on the staff screen is, hey, I gave this guy permissions, and guess what? He goes into RMS. He or she goes into RMS, and they don't have those permissions. It's very common. We get that. Why? Well, because what we thought the username that they were using isn't actually the username that they were using. They were using something else because they either got a new cat card or, you know, they have several logins to RMS or whatever. So keep in mind when you do make changes to permissions, one, make sure to back off the screen so it takes the change. And two, make sure you got the right user that they're using to log into RMS. Um, and and uh, you can link up cat cards to staff inside of those screens. If you still have problems, definitely contact the RMS support center. We can help you out. All right. Questions, if you guys have them, go for it. We'll give you a couple minutes for that. Uh, I'll go on mute while that happens. Feel free to unmute yourselves if you want to and ask questions. If we don't hear anything for a minute or so, we'll continue on. Alrighty, I'm not hearing anything. Feel free to type out questions too if you want. I know I'm behind on the slides, so I'm going to go a little bit faster. All right, we're going to go through the finances tab. Uh, this this will probably be the, the uh, we'll spend a lot of time here. So. Uh, feel free to type out a lot of questions. We'll try to go through a little bit slower on this on this part. Usually, the next few parts when we talk about closeout and import export, there's there's not as much interest in those areas. So uh, try to we'll try to be as detailed as we can here. If we're going too fast, tell us to slow down. Uh, it, definitely ask questions in the chat. Which, by the way, I figured out how to have on my screen without it showing to you guys. So, alrighty. Setting up contract, uh, setting up contracts in RMS uh, involves finances, and of course, everyone knows when it comes to finances, CFOMS is the system of record when it comes to anything with a dollar amount. RMS will interface with CFOMS and pull down the obligations, which you can then link to line items and then send off to the contractor in the form of pay activities. The contractor will take those pay activities and link them up to all sorts of things on their contractor mode. And do uh, and, and set up uh, every month. They will do a progress payment and report progress on those pay activities, uh, either through a schedule, through percentages, or or through daily reports or whatnot. And they will ask for a portion of money on those pay activities, which will then link to the line items, which 
usually m matches up to the contract amount. Um, the finances are obviously a very important and sensitive part of RMS. Um, usually you don't want to go in here without knowing what you're going to do beforehand. Uh, again, training contracts are a great way to play with a lot of this stuff because there's no consequences. I can set up a contract for 900 million. I can play around with deleting and adding invoices, and it's a great way to learn. That's how I learned to deal with RMS. Um, I, a lot of times we get questions from users asking us about CFOMs. We do not have access to CFOMs. Uh, RMS Support Center does not have access to CFOMs. We cannot support CFOMs. Do we know a little bit about CFOMs? Yeah, some of us know a lot more about CFOMs than others. For example, James, he knows a heck of a lot more about CFOMs than I do. Uh, so usually when you call up and you have questions about CFOMs, we can we can at least point you in the right direction. But officially, if you have a CFOMs question, you got to go to CFOMs. Uh, as another government AIS system, they have their own support and whatnot. Uh, but again, if you're an RMS and you have problems, definitely contact us. We can do what we can to help you and point you in the right direction. All right, on the finances tab, just FYI, if you go to the finances tab and it says future contract, that means your milestones haven't been set up yet. It's kind of important, right? Because you're not going to see any of these tabs. <laughs> but on this contract that we're on right now, uh, you'll see a whole bunch of modules, contract finances, contract awards. But again, if it says future contract, you've got to head over to the schedules, go to the milestone schedule and put in a contract start date and NTP. And I think there's another one, but I can't remember what it is right now. And then you'll be able to go in and set up your finances. Um, I'm going to be asking for James's help on a lot of this stuff because he knows a lot more about this than I do. But uh, oh, yeah, so this just kind of lets you know all the sub modules inside of the finances module, right? So here we can set up the finances, we can set up the line items, we can set up the pay activities, we can deal with progress payments, very important. We can deal with changes and any disputes that come along with those changes. All righty, the most important thing in RMS is that when you're setting up the contract number, it needs to match exactly what's inside of P2 and CFOMs. Why? Because if it doesn't match up, it's not going to sync. Those background processes that I was talking about that happened in the background, you're not going to get those two to link up if they're not matching perfectly. And when I say match perfectly, I'm talking the dashes, the spaces, the, the, the work order numbers. All those have to be 100% perfect. In P2, if they don't have dashes, they cannot have dashes in RMS and vice versa. They have dashes. They got to have dashes in RMS. One of the most common problems that we get, uh, you know, hey, things aren't linking up. It's because of that. They don't have dashes. They don't have spaces. They're not 100% exact. Um, we get a lot of those. So that, that's a fairly common problem. Um, it's same thing with with, uh, with CFOMs and, and all that stuff. Again, CFOMs deals with obligations and funding accounts, and RMS breaks those down into line items. And then we break those down even further into pay activities for the contractor so that the contractor can take those and break those down even further into whatever they deal with, features of work, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, um, all right. Uh, uh, the the CFOMS download button, James, can I let you explain what that does in the CFOMS cleanup button? Certainly. So okay. the CFOMS download will interface with CFOMS based upon the contract number. So in the contract description view, you can set that contract number and delivery order. They have to match precisely, including any dashes or spaces. So if you have removed the dashes from your contract number, you need to remove it uh, in RMS to match CFMS, which is the newer style. The CFMS cleanup has been overrated a little bit. Uh, we used to always do the CFMS cleanup, which basically means that if a funding account or obligation or something was removed from CFMS, it would actually remove it from RMS if it wasn't paid on and so forth. So it actually uh, was always done, so it's not harmful to do in most cases. Uh, if you accidentally entered the contract number wrong, and then downloaded it, it may remove some finances. So that's why we typically recommend you do the CFMS download unless you need to clean up some extra funding accounts that are no longer associated with the contract. Back to you, Paul. All right, perfect. Um, very good, very good. Okay, uh, this screen kind of, it, it, it lets you know that the data from CFMS can be sorted via appropriations, funding accounts, PRNCs, 
obligations and whatnot. And again, without having to click those little arrows on the left hand side, you can expand or collapse all of those in one action with that green box in the middle there. Alrighty. Oh, yeah, for it's very important for training. Just FYI, we, we deal with non CFMS contracts all the time because obviously our, our training database doesn't link up with CFMS and uh, yeah. Oh, okay. So here's his uh, a screen on CFMS cleanup. There's warnings because there's usually severe consequences when you click on these op options. James I'll let you know CFMS downloads kind of harmless. CFMS cleanup, on the other hand, is is quite the opposite. Um, and we'll go in. And, James, did you want to talk about this one at all, or are you? Yep, we're good. Good. All right, very good. So, so yeah, proceed with caution. You don't want to be clicking on these just you know whenever you want to. This is something that. Uh, if you have any questions, again, contact the Arma Support Center um, on, 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 on when you should be doing these. All right. After the award on the contract, again, to get to the screen, you've got to set up your schedule with the NTP and the contract start date and all that stuff. Uh, you're going to be going in here and looking at some of the funding account items. Um, uh, again, a lot of this stuff comes from CFOMS. There's not much you can do with it in RMS other than look at it, see if it looks familiar, and... And if it doesn't, that's when you'll be calling you the, the Arma Support Center or dealing with CFOMS. This is the contract funding. This is where you can set up uh, funding accounts. This is important because you're going to be setting the program type as well as funding the contract. James, correct me if I'm saying anything that I'm not, uh, anything wrong, because th uh, this is probably my least familiar area with RMS because we don't usually play with a lot of this stuff when, when I say we, when I'm dealing with contracts. So most of the questions that we have tend to deal with when you're in the contract level. But anyway, you set up your contract funding here, you put, you put dollar amounts on there, and then you can, you can use those to fund your line items, uh, which will uh, equal to the, um, the contract amount. Um, there's some of the information off to the right-hand side for those of you that deal with these modules. For example, RMS admins, uh, you know, again, John Stevens, Drexler, some of the guys that we've worked with in the past, they they deal with this stuff all the time. They're very familiar with this stuff, and it can get quite complicated. Um, and you can spend you can spend days talking about this stuff. All right. Project funding, again, this is where you put in the uh, contract amount. It's very important to get this right because Obviously, the whole reason why the contractors use RMS is to get paid, right? They go in here, they're going to ask for a certain chunk of the contract award amount on a per month basis via invoices. And you're going to go in to RMS, make sure that one, they're doing what they should be doing. And two, you'll be making sure that this information adds up so that when it goes off to CFOMS to actually cut the check, things are as they should be. All right. Uh, yep, contract award is editable. You can go in here and change that, make sure that amounts up. Obviously, you're going to need funding accounts to back that up for the obligations, and then the line items can be funded. All right, we have the funding balances. You can, uh, just so you know, on these screens, you, you can click, right? So right now, the middle funding accounts highlighted. When you click the bottom number three, it will change all of the data at the bottom that's, um, that's related to that funding account. Uh, again, note the checkbox there account can be used to fund other contracts. If this, if this funding account is not just for this contract and it's going to be used on multiple contracts, say there's a certain work order numbers or, or the funding account is just large enough that it's going to be funding multiple contracts, uh, make sure to check that box. Again, we're in the contract finances button uh, underneath finances. All right, here are the obligation balances. Um, Again, not much to say on here. If you have questions, feel free to type them in. This this stuff, uh, James, correct me if I'm wrong, comes down from CFOMS. So if the data doesn't look right, um, a lot of times it's because uh, what's in CFOMS is not what you expect, or it, you know, there's a various number of other things. But again, all this data usually usually comes from CFOMS, and it's it's important that all this is correct because everything relies on that dollar amount, right? The contract amount has to be funded. The line items have to match, match the contract amount, and then obviously for that to happen, then you can move to the next step, setting up the contractor. Then the contractor can work on uh, asking for payment. All right, this screen right here is the award plans. Again, award refers to uh, once you've set up the funding and you've got everything set up with CFOMS, uh, assuming it's not a non-CFOMS contract, 
then uh, you can go in here and set up each one of the line items. Uh, each one of these line items have to match up to the contract amount, right? If the contract amount does not match these line items, there's gonna be a variance and it will not let you go on to the next part. So in this case right here, we, we see that $8 million for this contract matches each one of these line items. Uh, just FYI, the award cleans uh, will, will stay that way for the life of the contract. So if I go in and I, I do a whole bunch of mods, uh, you know, changes to some of the contract amounts and, and whatnot, this, this award cleans is what happened at award. So that, that will stay that way. To see the changes, I believe that's on the, um, on the next screen. But anyway, first we're gonna talk about setting up a line item. When you go to add a line item, you'll have the choice of doing either a parent claim or a uh, price sub claim. Um, there's there's a lot of rules on <laughs> on how to add line items. James, uh, can I ask you to talk a little bit about this? Uh, go for it. Okay. So generally, the, uh, the price parent clan is used when uh, you need to have several sub clans with different funding amounts. Uh, the key item that you want to make sure and note is that you cannot put more than one type of funding on a sub clan. So if you need multiple uh, funding, then you need to use the parent clans. Uh, so there is just basically the structure where you normally would use the parent uh clin unless you need to get the uh separate funding in the subclin perfect and and to answer that question real quick yes rms works with cfums as far as sps I, I um james I'll, I'll let you type that out or if you want you can answer that question real quick good okay i'll answer that in the chat all right, perfect. Sounds good. All right, moving on. We got to we got to get going. I think we have uh, quite a few slides, but yes, it does work with CFOMs. Goes, uh, it, it, yeah, yep, yep. That's why it's important to make sure to have the contract number and the work order number correctly. All right. Okay. When we're adding the uh, the line items, it's real important to get the unit of measure correctly. It's also important to get the um, award amount right. Because when we go in and we check that box that the pricing is complete and we're ready to fund it, we're going to pull from all the screens that we did before, right? The obligations from CFOMS. And each one of those obligations have to be funded, right? Uh, and before we can assign a dollar amount to this line item. So you're going to work from top down basically here. You can put in the description. You're going to use your unit of measure. I think they don't want us using lump sum anymore, but that was the most common one if it's not currently you put in your dollar amount once you put in your dollar amount you're going to check the box right and you're going to say i'm ready to fund this line item and uh, when you hit the funding button it'll go through and allow you to select the specific uh obligation that you're going to use to fund this and it's real real important you can you can select uh multiple funding accounts as well as uh see if there's a variance right because uh sometimes some of these line items are funded by multiple uh, obligations not just one like this contract is right here right so it can get real complicated real quick. All right, here's a massive blurb on uh, price sub cleans and parent cleans. I will let you guys read this on your own. If there's any questions, please feel free to ask them. Uh, we try to put as, as much helpful information in here as possible without getting into district policy, which again, every district has their own policy when it comes to uh, procedures on how to do specific line items, especially when it deals with dollar amounts. Uh, but again, um, a lot of this varies too, right? If you're if you're using uh, not CFOMs or whatnot, it or non CFOMs accounts, it's it's very different. Alrighty, okay. This grid right here are the current line items. Remember, I was telling you before, there's the award claims. This is the current claims. This will show you the current state of the claims with mods and changes, right? So before the award claims will be at award. This will be the uh, current line items after modifications, and it will have a history. So I can go and I can click clean number four and see that there were a whole bunch of different uh, whatever changes done to it, right, from the mods and whatnot. Or if I went in and manually changed it, that'll have a history there. All right, pay activities. Why are pay activities important? Pay activities are important because they are a further breakdown of the line items and contractors will be asking for payment on those pay activities. Uh, that's how they ask for payment. So you 
Uh, usually when the government goes in and they create the contract, they're going to create a, a handful or so of line items. They'll just go in and hit one button and create a whole bunch of pay activities that mirror that, right? So that way it, it balances out. You send it off to the contractor. It's now the contractor's job to go in uh, to either import their schedule from Primavera or to, you know, to further break down those pay activities. Uh, however, was discussed between the government and the contractor, right? Uh, this obviously involves a lot of communication with the contractor, uh, you know, because they're going to be going in and they're going to be taking these pay activities and breaking them down further. The contractor will need to make sure to uh, to balance these out with the line items. So, for example, down below, uh, for, this is obviously from the government's view, right? And the government's going to go in and usually they just mirror the activities with the line items to make it real easy. But in this contract, this is a, a bit more of an advanced contract. You can sort uh, all the activities by either line items, by contractors, by features. You can also sort them if they have no line item assigned to them. So, by the way, if you do have an activity without a line item, it's going to complain. There'll be a big red box. There'll be a variance. There'll be, you know, there'll be warnings. Um, so you can either sort them with those big blue tiles in the middle. You know, activities without a line item. Uh, I think there's another one there that's unbalanced or something like that when there's no balanced. Um, and whatnot, uh, let's see here. What do we got? Yeah, so going going down, you can sort the activities by line items. So I can double click on these and and see which ones are unbalanced, which ones are not, uh, which ones are balanced, uh, and and whatnot. This the screen's kind of um, it's it's a great way to find out if there's problems, right? Because you can't create an invoice if there's a, an imbalance, and you can you can vary this down to find out exactly where the problem is. So I know line item number five has three activities. And it's balanced. If it wasn't, it'd be a big red unbalanced, and you could tell the contractor, hey, your schedule is not balanced. Again, here you can break down the number of activities assigned to contractors. Again, your contract may not do this. Some contracts do, some contracts don't. Uh, you can require your contractor to make sure that they link up activities to certain subcontractors. subcontractors. It's it's all up to you guys. It's all up to you guys. I am hearing an echo. Oh, it went away. Okay, very good. All right, so again, features of work. If uh, you know, if the contractor has a, a massive amount of features of work, then go in and assign the activities to the features of work. Right. All right. Moving on. Pay activities. So we kind of talked about the same thing. The reason why pay activities are important because the contractor is going to take those and link those into everything when it comes to contractor mode. They can assign those to uh, you know submittals, to tests, to deficiencies, to uh, a lot of times when contractors, when it's a larger contractor, they're going to have Primavera and it will do all of that for them, right? And they can import that into RMS. It's important to note if your contractor is using Primavera that um, that whatever they do inside of RMS, it, when, when it comes to pay activities, it will be overwritten when they do an import from Primavera. So Primavera will be considered the system of record when it comes to activities if the contractor is using that. If it's a smaller contractor, you can set RMS up to manually enter the start finish dates, manually enter the finances and all that stuff, right? Uh, but a, a lot of the contracts out there will use Primavera and it's important. If there's a problem, they need to fix it in Primavera, then do the import into RMS. If they mess up RMS, they can just import from Primavera and that will overwrite whatever's in RMS when it comes to activities uh, and, and schedules and stuff like that, right? So. Uh, we don't really need to talk about much here. We've got the, um, you can sort these down kind of like you could with the line item screen. You can sort them by line item, by contractor, by features. Those, but those blue tiles at the top, very important. It makes it really easy to find stuff um, if, if you need to. Okay. And yes, this all has to be balanced before the contractor can go and create an invoice. So a lot of times, if you're one of those RMS administrators that goes in and creates contracts, a lot of the RMS administrators will make it easy for the contractor and just mirror the activities with the line items so that it, so that it's balanced, right? Obviously, you want the contractor to take that and either do an, an SDF import or break that down further. Alrighty, moving on. The, um, the pay activities are kind of similar to the, um, to the cleanse, right? When it comes to how the cleanse are set up, if the cleanse are lump sum, or if they're, so for example, here they're set to be a quantity clean when, when it comes to cubic yards or whatnot, it will dictate how the uh, how the contractor will go in and and set up the activity when it comes to, um, to to pricing it out, right? So, for example, here on this this pay activity screen, 
the contractor can go in. Obviously, this is the government, right? Doing this right now. Usually the contractor will go in here and set the subcontractor to the pay activity. They'll set a feature of work, work category code, a dredge if it's a dredging contract. Um, usually the government's not going to be going in here on the pay activities and doing this, but this is what it looks like if you were to go in on the screen uh, and do this. Right? Oops, wrong button. Yeah, same thing here. Um, this activity is linked to an amount only, uh, an amount only CLIN. So before we were talking about a quantity CLIN, I went back one. I'm going to go forward again. This is an amount CLIN. Like, for example, lump sum, which I, I think you're not supposed, we're not supposed to be using anymore, but uh, a lot of the contracts have them. Uh, that, that's where you just put a dollar amount in. And again, that can be changed. Again, if the contractor is going in and doing Primavera, not ever going to be in these screens, right? They're not going to be in these screens. You're not going to be in these screens. All this will import from the SDF file in Primavera. All right. Um, again, to do any mods or anything further on the contract, you will need to make sure that everything's balanced. If it's not balanced, RMS kind of grinds everything to a halt, right? You, you can't do an invoice. You can't do a modification. You can't do pretty much anything. Obviously, daily reports, you can go in and do those, but uh, need to make sure that everything is balanced. Got a little bit of extra information there about credit mods and stuff like that. All right, moving on. Manually adding a pay activity or a, a, an activity ID. When you go in and you hit the add button, it's going to ask you for the activity number. What do you put in there? Whatever you want. Uh, usually it's a numerical value, depending on how many pay activities they're going to have. You can have a leading set of zeros. You know, So if there's a thousand activities, you can have three zeros, whatever. Again, you probably won't be doing this unless you're uh, setting up a contract for brand new and you're just adding the activities to mirror the line items. The contractor is usually expected to go in and do this stuff uh, and use Primavera to, to add, you know, to pop it out or to populate it, excuse me. Um, yep, this is what it looks like again to add a uh, pay activity to RMS. Note at the bottom, it lets the contractor know if they're, if they're using RMS to add these that um, it, whether or not all the activities balance with the line item. So if this is the very first activity they're adding, it's not gonna balance, right? So if this line item has $137,000, the very first activity that I'm adding is not gonna be balanced, there'll be a variance. And eventually as I add it on, uh, it, will, it will add up and then balance out. Um, again, there's tabs there for dredging contracts, comments if there's comments needed on the specific activity. Some districts, they asked for that ability, so we put that in there um, and whatnot. Usually, all this stuff comes from Primavera, uh, unless it's a smaller contract and the contractor does not use Primavera, because we all know Primavera is uh, fairly expensive. All right. Yep, uh, we've kind of already talked about all this. This is what the variance looks like. Um, for example, uh, down at the bottom left there, if there's a variance, it'll, it'll be in red, uh, and it won't let the contractor go and ask for payment. So a lot of times, you can ask them, well, open up your pay activities. Is everything balanced? If it's not balanced, it will let you know. Um, yeah, deleting and uh, 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 pay activity, right? Uh, usually, again, you're not going to manually go in and delete pay activities. Why? Because if you're using Primavera, like the vast majority of them are, you just do another SDF import and it will wipe out whatever's in RMS that isn't in Primavera, right? So in Primavera, I can go in and wipe out a whole bunch of pay activities. Next time I do an SDF import, they all disappear out of RMS. Usually, you're not going to be doing that. Uh, it's kind of rare. But say in RMS, you wanted to go in and delete a pay activity because you're in a training contract, or you actually want to do it in RMS because they're not using Primavera, you can hit the delete button and delete that pay activity. Note, it's really difficult to delete a pay activity if it's been assigned to certain things, like subcontractors, and it's had dollar amounts charged against it. RMS will complain bitterly if you go in and try to delete a pay activity that has history on it, which FYI kind of makes it difficult to go in and delete pay activities if there's been any work done on those pay activities, right? RMS also has the ability to multi-select and um, delete multiple pay activities. Uh, you can go in here, you can hit the delete button, enable multiple delete, and kind of hold down the shift key. And if you do it just right, you can select multiple pay activities to delete them, especially if there's like 20,000 of them, right? Uh, and you can wipe them all out uh, in one go. It's a select, delete, select, delete, select, delete. But again, uh, I'll say this over and over again. The reason why I say it over and over again, because we get a lot of questions on it. If if the, if you have to go in here and delete all these and you're using Primavera, that's a problem. Why? Because all you have to do is do another SDF import and all that will disappear if you deleted it in Primavera. So if your contractor is calling you up going, hey, I use Primavera, but I'm going, I can't delete all my pay activities in RMS, 
uh, before I do the SDF import, you can tell them right away. Just do just do the SDF import. Anything in RMS that's not in Primavera will will get wiped out. Uh, that's why you got to make sure Primavera is set up correctly. Again, this is only on contracts that use Primavera. All right. We have quite a few warning messages, uh, you know, about deleting pay activities. That's usually a severe action. You're not going to be doing this very often. All right, moving on. Contract changes. Here is where you've set up the contract. You've done your fun your funding. You uh, usually have your pay activity set up. The contractor's done the schedule. You might have a few progress payments invoices where you've billed the contract and work's been done. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, wow. Okay. All right. There, there's a change to the cost of certain materials, or there's a change to the way this contract needs to be done because whatever changes, what, you know, the contractor wants more or the contractor wants more or. Uh, something happened, you know, to the job site that requires a change. That's where you're going to go in and you're going to set up the change and then do a modification on that change after you got the change set up. So, by the way, the contract changes and the mods work together. You're going to set up the change, then you'll set up the mod. The mod is kind of the, a, James, correct me if I'm wrong, but the mod is kind of the, all right, the change is going to happen. We're going to make it actually happen on the contract. So. Here is what a basic change document looks like. This is the end goal for those two modules, right? You got the change, you got the mod, and you're gonna you're gonna go in and you're gonna change something on the contract, whether it be a dollar amount, whether it be terms, whether it be whatever, right? Uh, the, the, your end goal is to pop out that basic change document in, in inside of RMS. And setting up a change on a modification is a little bit complicated, and it can have consequences, right? Because you're gonna change some dollar amounts or whatnot. So again, here inside of a change request, you have a whole bunch of things you got to do. You got to set up the plans, you got to set up the specifications, you got to set up the basic change document, the proposal. There's usually no negotiations that are set up, and whether or not it involves a dollar amount change and funding to to set up that change. This is where we were talking about the award cleanse. The award cleanse, those values may change over time, right? So the award cleanse is a snapshot of what the contract was when you first created it. The current cleanse will be what the cleanse are after modifications, right? So here we have a, uh, a list of what has to happen. You can, by the way, you can go in and create a whole bunch of changes and, and not do anything with them, right? Because a lot of times some of these will have negotiations and then nothing happens, right? So you can go in and create a whole bunch of changes. It's up to you guys to take those further into actual modifications to the contract. All right, so when you go and you create a contract change, you'll have a list of things that you can choose, whether it be a single part, multi-part, a subsequent part that you added later on to a multi-part change, or whether or not it's a weather modification. Um, and usually based on what radio button you choose, again, you can go in and create this change and decide, oh, nope, I don't want to do that, delete it, come back, redo it, whatever you want. Um, uh, yeah, all right, so adding a new change request, there's going to be a whole bunch of questions a, uh, when, when you go through to set these up. Uh, there's there's going to be what is that? Five tabs, One, two, three, four, five. Yes. Yeah, so we've got the inception of the change, the description, the funding, if it needs to be the dispute or the claim that the contractor has, if it's, if it's contractor side, and then the supporting documents that happen to that contract change, right? Each 1 of these need to be filled out perfectly. Why? Because again, they all translate into the basic change document. Nope. Top right hand corner there. The BCD that that does, doesn't look like it's a button, but it's a button. You can hit that button, and it will try to generate the basic change document based on what you filled out so far, uh, and that will let you know how close you're getting to an official uh, change, so you can send that off to a modification, right? So again, these dates. If you if you call us up at the RMS Support Center and you say, "What date should I put in here?" We at the RMS Support Center will tell you. We have no idea. We you need to contact your district for that. Uh, what we can answer is what will happen if you do certain things, right? Uh, how, you know, because we're not using the program out in the field like you guys are. So, what what agency code to choose? What reason code to choose? What mod type type code to choose? We really can't tell you what to put in these screens. Uh, but note again, those blue bars. You click on them, that lets you do a lookup, right? Um, as we continue on, you can set up uh, the description for the change request again. Uh, you, you might note, by the way, those of you that have done uh, changes in the you know in the past, some of these boxes have fixed width uh, font because some districts they copy and paste a lot of stuff in here and they want it to look a certain way on the report. So you'll note that I don't know if it's on this exact screen, but sometimes the change in specifications, change in drawings, 
that uh, it, it it has fixed width font, you know, like courier new, and that that way they can copy and paste something in there that has spaces to make it look real nice on the the BCD. Um, so if you if you notice a, a font change, it's not necessarily a bug in RMS. Uh, it's it's because a certain district or districts asked for that that permission. Uh, again, you're filling out all this information inside of RMS so that you can generate the BCD at any point in time. You're more than welcome to hit the BCD to generate what you what it would look like up until up until this point. Right. This is real important on this screen. This is the status of the change request, whether or not a BCD is required, whether or not plans are required based on the type of change. You check that box, right? Obviously, everything's grayed out in the screenshot because it's gotten to the point where they're at funding. But before they get to that point, uh, you can check the box saying specifications are required. Uh, who's who's whose action is that? When are the dates needed, right? And if, and how much time it's going to take. So it's important to fill this out uh, so that one um, people looking at it in the future will know what's going on, what's been done. Uh, you can also change the status at the bottom left hand corner as the uh, change progresses. Uh, did I go too far forward? I don't think so. All right, very good. All right, so that's that's pretty much it for the contract change. Um, let's continue on to contract modifications. Modifications basically take the contract changes and they 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 enact them. Um, uh, James, correct me if I'm wrong. I may be saying something that I shouldn't. Again, we here at the RMS Support Center, we use RMS in the confines of test, right? So we're not actually out in the field like you guys. Your district's going to have a very specific set of requirements and policies that come with how to do mods, you know, and I'm sure there's a lot of training that's involved with this. And again, all of this is to get you to the point so that you can go in here and generate documents, right? For, I think it's the SF30 or something like that, that, that does the contract change. Let me see here, or excuse me, the modification. So here, you're going to, you're going to go in and link up change requests, multiple if, if, if required, right? And next, you're going to choose the line items if there's funding changes to this uh, from this change, right, to this modification. And if necessary, if it's a if it's an increased amount, which a lot of them usually are, right? Contractors usually asking for more money, something changed that requires more money. Uh, you're gonna you're gonna have to add funding accounts to this change or to this modification in order to fund the increased um, increased amounts on this um, on this contract. Uh, all right, so. Go here. This uh, the whole goal of this is to get to the SF30. So a lot of these screens will be specific blocks on the SF30. Um, we we sometimes get questions on you know uh, why isn't every single block on here? Um, that's just the the way it is. I think most districts don't use every single uh, block on on the SF30. I could be wrong thinking about the BCD, but anyway, uh, you, you're going to be filling out all this information to generate that SF30 in the end. Um, we right here we tell you which block is which. Um, go right here. These are the titles. The um, there's lookups on some of these things that you can choose. You can put in a far far lookup and whatnot for the administrative changes or whatnot. Uh, right here again, we're continuing on with the SF30. Uh, it's, it's it's a fairly long document with quite a few blocks of information. And, uh, just so you guys notice, there's that little clipboard icon with the notepad and the pen uh, right to the left of the big boxes. You can click that and get a bigger box to type in information into RMS for that screen. So if you have a lot of data that you'd like to see, you can do that. Alrighty. As we continue, oh, same thing on the mod that you had with the change request. You can you can open up the SF30 here, and um, you can run it uh, and see what it looks like before you actually get it done, right? Because because a lot of times you're filling this out and you're wondering, all right, what does the final SF30 look like without having to actually complete the modification, right? You can go here and hit that SF30 and run what it looks like up until this point. Okay. Um, Again, as you're moving on with the modification, you can choose whether or not a signature is required uh, down at the bottom, whether or not there's funding involved with the contract uh, modifications, uh, you know, whether or not um, the modification itself is complete. Right? So continue on. This is whether or not there's changes to the line items after the funding has been decided. So you can go in here and you can say, all right, the obligation has this much. We're going to change this specific line item by this certain amount. Uh, 
you know, I'll let you know what's happening there. Whether or not there's, uh, all right, so this will be, yeah, same thing. When you go in and change the amount, usually when you do a mod, there's obviously going to be an imbalance, right? The contractor is going to have to go in and do the, um, do, do another SF import to fix up all their activities to link up with the new change to the line item. Now, uh, those of you that have, have have done this before in the past, we we get a fair number of contractors calling up going, hey, I imported my new schedule with the agreed mod changes and it's unbalanced. And that's because it hasn't been approved finally inside of RMS, but it was actually done in CFOMS. So that, that's fairly common, you know, where, you know, sometimes it takes a little bit for RMS to be updated to show on the contractor side. Contractor, they went and met with the government, boom, they made their change, yes, you know, yesterday or whatever, right? So anyway, it, it's something to keep in mind too. Uh, whenever you do a mod, uh, it changes the amount uh, that can cause an imbalance. And sometimes the contractor does it before the government. Sometimes the government does it before the contractor. Very common to get a call from the contractor going, why is this, why is this changed? All right. Uh, yeah, so uh, government can use the pay activity screen to go in here and change all this stuff if they want to, or the government can, if the government has the contractor there and, and you know they feel so inclined, they can make everything balance out. Alrighty, now this screen is gonna look a little bit different to some of you that have worked in RMS in the past, right? Uh, in the past, headquarters, uh, I, I'm not 100% certain if it was headquarters, they had the list of all those check boxes that we had to go through before we could actually do uh, an invoice, right? Or excuse me, a, a modification. And it was required. You had to check every single one of those checkboxes before you could finish out the modification. Well, there was a change to the CCB, or the CCB initiated a change to make this a bit more streamlined and a little bit more modern. So you're going to go into the supporting documents and add a document package in, in the mod package that, to put all those documents that are required because you know not every single one of those are always required, right? You check that box, uh, you don't have to check that box on every single modification. Every district does things a little bit differently. So you're gonna go in here and uh, you're gonna add a new document package. And when you add the new document package, you're gonna pay attention to the PCF container. That PCF container will let you know all those checkboxes that you saw before, statement at work, solicitation, government estimate, contractors off all the way down to supporting documents. So inside of the document package, that's where you're going to be doing all of your previous checkboxes, put, put in the date, all that, you know, clicks. The, the, the goal of that, that CR, CRQ, the CCB, was to reduce the number of clicks and to make this more of a streamlined process, right? So that uh, things, things would go faster. Uh, overall, uh, you know, there's, there's been a pretty positive response to this. There's been a few older RMS users that will open up RMS and try to do a mod and wow, what, what, what's changed, right? So uh, that we, we get those every now and then. But anyway, so that, this, this mod process has changed up a little bit. We definitely believe it's, it's a lot faster. You, you just dra drag and drop your documents in here, set whatever PCF container you want to uh, point those to. That way, when you complete the document package, FYI, you gotta complete the document package for these things to go off to PCF. If you didn't know that, now you know it. Um, that, that's part of the modification uh, process now. Instead of having that checkbox, uh, go do that specific part of work. Checkbox, go do that part of the work. There's 45 different clicks for every single process, that sort of thing. It, uh, definitely, most people like this process when it comes to a modification. Um, if you're having any questions or comments on this, definitely let us know. All right, okay. Uh, obviously, the goal of a modification is to have all green checkboxes, meaning everything works, everything's going the way it should, everything's funded, activities are balanced, Good to go. Uh, so uh, again, when you when you go to the contract modification screen, you can select those modifications, and it will show the the status for each one of those as you're clicking through there. All right. All right. Going on. I think we're going to go to the claims and disputes. And let's see here. So yeah, claims and dis <laughs> excuse me. I'm so sorry. Uh, claims and disputes uh, that. Basically, an area for uh, if the contractor has claims against the government, if there's disputes on certain things. Uh, we don't get too many questions on this. I, I don't know if that's because it's kind of rare or whatnot. This screen right here is letting you know um, whenever you're in a view, you can take, uh, for example, that report menu right there, and you can drag and drop that to the top bar, and it will group all the information by the report menu. Uh, it's something that, uh, like, so for example, right here, I don't know if you guys can see my mouse, probably not. 
uh, I know when I change it to a, a laser pointer, it, the CPU fan starts going nuts. Anyway, you guys, I think you guys can see my mouse. So right here, so if I take this ID and I want to sort all the data in here, because usually you can have more than just two stuff, right? I can drag the ID to this, this header right here, and it will sort all of the data in here by that ID. And I can also take date received, drag it up here. So you can have grouped by multiple times uh, and, and you know, subgroup by, and you can reorder them and whatnot. So it's just letting you know about that. All right. Okay, so again, really not don't need to spend too much time on this. I, I, I we were hoping to have some uh, questions and answers at the end, so I'm going to fire through the rest of this because uh, at least um, in the past there hasn't been too many questions on this stuff. So I'm going to go a little bit faster because uh, there's usually not a lot of questions on this. Um, again, you can set the type of the claim and dispute. Again, the the end goal of a lot of stuff in RMS is to get these on to reports. Right, you get the report. Um, you get you get the, all this information out to a report, and that's what gets sent off to whatever, right? So here with the contractor claims, you got the contractor claims area. All right, real quick, uh, any questions? We'll all go on mute. Let you guys uh, hash those out. If you have any questions, if I don't hear anything for about a minute, I will uh, continue on. Feel free to uh, hit mute, unmute yourself, and ask questions if you'd like to. I'll give it about 10 seconds and we'll continue on. What about the, uh, the function uh, from RMS to, uh, to PCF on the completed mods? Right, so, so inside of a document package, uh, the RMS3, say, say I wanna get something to PCF, right? I have to go inside of a document package and complete that document package. Most of the time, I'm getting a document package from the contractor, right? So I've gotta approve the document package, then complete it, right? Uh, and, and from what we're hearing from a lot of y'all is that uh, PCF likes signed documents. So a lot of times we try to encourage users to sign documents in the document package, but just so you guys note, until you complete out that document package, nothing gets sent to PCF. Uh, and of course, just so you all know too, I, I saw it in the comments, uh, that just because you complete the document package doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna magically appear in PCF. Is there anything you can do about it? Not really. There's a batch process that runs in the background of RMS that takes the data in those document packages and sends it off to PCF. And if you guys can imagine, PCF is a massive data center uh, on the DoD network far away from RMS. So it's got to traverse that network to send all that data out to PCF. And, um, and we all know how RMS is be becoming more and more of a file storage application when it comes to attachments. So you can imagine that PCF process, if, if contract XYZ in certain district goes and uploads terabytes of data and tries to send it off to PCF, there could be a few day backlog when it goes to sending data off to PCF. And of course, we, we get calls from you guys saying, hey, I got in trouble because my data is not appearing in PCF and I completed out this document package. It's not in PCF. Why is that? And then, by the way, feel free to contact us about that, please, because that we, we can look. We can look at the background process and we'll see, oh, yeah, right. There's there's either an outage or there's a there's a bottleneck happening because of some out you know maintenance or or there's just a ton of data that's waiting to get sent uh, uh, to go off to PCF. I don't know if you guys noticed there's a limit to the attachment size in the document package, right? You can only have 250 megabytes uh, uh, on on per file. The reason why we did that is because we found out that. Uh, when you upload a gigabyte attachment, it it pretty much shuts down the PCF upload to um, to that to that database. So that's why we had to have that limit for the attachments. Now you can have a yeah. So anyway, <clears throat> hopefully that answered the question. If not, please ask again. But also, if if you're getting if you're getting you know slapped for not getting your stuff into PCF, please please put in a ticket. We we can help you find out. Uh, from your perspective, as long as you've completed the document package and it shows up in the contract file, you've done everything you can do. And usually at that point, it's not your fault. When I say usually, I'm talking like 99% of the time. Anyway, all right, moving on. Schedules tab. I, I may need some help from James here because, uh, again, this is not something I'm terribly familiar with when it, when it, uh, when it comes to uh, schedules. Uh, again, usually on the government side, when it comes to schedules, this is something that the contractor is going to spend a lot of time in. So we, we have a massive amount of information here. I'll let you guys read this on your own time with the slides. Um, 
you, again, you could have a couple day training on schedules by itself. I've seen them. I haven't necessarily been a part of them, but I have seen them and uh, they, they can get really complicated. Usually the contractor is going to be using uh, an, an NAS, a network analysis system, right? Uh, like Primavera. And they're going to use SDEF to take that data and pop that data into RMS. SDEF is just standard data exchange format. It's a text-based file format that RMS imports from Primavera. Uh, can you use something else? It has to conform to SDEF and then it'll work. So there's, there's, uh, you know, Microsoft, I, I, for, I forget, it's either Access or something like that. But back in the day, you could use that instead of Primavera. Not sure if you can still do that today. Usually, government requires Primavera. All right. So, uh, again, you know, a lot of the questions from are, are is the government going to go in here and put this data in? No, nope, no. Nope. Usually, the contractor is going to be doing all this stuff, right? Uh, when it comes to pay activities, and the schedules with the start and finish dates, the actual schedules, 90% of the time that's going to come from Primavera and the contractor is going to be doing it. But just letting you guys know what it looks like uh, inside of RMS, you can set RMS to do manual start and finish dates in the daily reports and on the activity schedule here. You can do that in the contract setup area. Um, yeah, all right, moving on. Uh, same thing here, uh, milestones. Milestones are very important. Uh, again, those of you that add contracts for the first time instead of RMS, all right, uh, when I say first time, I mean adding a brand new contract, usually at the end of the fiscal year, uh, you're going to be going in here and setting up at least a couple of these milestones. Why? You have to in order for the finances to appear. Otherwise, it'll show a future contract. If I remember off the top of my head, it's NTP. It's contract start, contract award, something like that, and then uh, one or two others. Of course, you got to put the duration in there, uh, the contract, the, the the last date as well, the end date. Um, but the NTP is important because you can't do daily reports without the NTP date, notice to proceed date. Uh, and uh, the contractor cannot set milestone dates. That's up to the government. So it's important that the government goes in here and set this. And I think usually the one who sets up the contract is the one who does this. Uh, Again, we don't use RMS out in the field like y'all, so it's all based on your district policy. Uh, yeah, here we go, placement schedule. So, again, you could probably have a couple day training on this alone. I'm not going to spend too much time on this because, one, uh, I believe there's changes coming uh, when it comes to this module, uh, and it's fairly complicated. So, it's, it's uh, but anyway, you can use this to pop out uh, graphs of your projected placement when it comes to the contract status sheet and other things, uh, what you put in here will change how the graph appears. Of course, um, those of us that have worked with RMS for a while know that, uh, you know, when the graph isn't green, nobody's happy, and usually you try to change the graph to make it green. Uh, I uh, Back when I was doing tech support uh, for my full-time job here at the RMS Support Center, I spent a lot of time helping, uh, you know, government reps make that graph green so that, you know, everyone was happy. So there's a lot of things you can do on this on the screen to make placement uh, appear a certain way. I do believe, as I said before, they're they're planning on changing this this module significantly when it comes to how it's designed, how it operates. Kind of like a set standard, right? Because again, District A will do this very differently than District B, and District C will do this very differently. Oh, just so you guys know, a big big warning. You go in here and you change any of these values, especially on a contract that's been going on for a while, it's going to mess stuff up. Uh, so uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> we, we get a lot of calls from people. You can go in here and you can get to the point of no return fairly quickly. Uh, even for us, by the way, on, on the RMS side, it's not easy to come in here and fix some of this stuff. So it's, it's really good to have a plan of attack to set this and leave it that way for the rest of the contract, even if it results in stuff showing that you don't necessarily like, if you know what I'm saying. <clears throat> All right. Okay, a feature schedule. Again, this uh, usually comes from Primavera on the contractor side. So as the government, you're not gonna be doing much of anything in here. Um, yeah, not much else to say, continuing on so we can get through. Any questions on this part of RMS? I'll put myself on mute, give you guys a minute to ask questions. I will try to fire through the next part in the next 10 minutes and then Get, we'll open up the floor to any questions. Alrighty, yo. I will try to get through this other part real fast because we don't usually get a lot of questions on it, and um, there, there there really aren't many questions. All right, so import export uh, inside of the import export module in RMS, 
Uh, that's that, that module on the right hand side there inside of a contract. So you got to open up a contract, go to the import export. We have a whole bunch of modules you can import from P2, deficiencies, submittals, real property from another contract, mod list, specs intact, SDEF. By the way, the government can import from SDEF if they want to. Some contracts, the government requires the contract to give them the SDEF file, they import it. Uh, and you can um, you can go inside of RMS and you can you can export out document packages. So for example, instead of going into all the transmittals and exporting out each one of the transmittals document packages one by one, you can mass do them all at once inside of the document package export. This is real handy when you need all the data in the contract real quick. Uh, it does not have all the document packages, but it does have some of the popular ones like uh, daily reports, transmittals and whatnot. Uh, importing from P2, of course, this is now done automatically in the background of RMS. Uh, if you have problems with that, please contact the RMS Support Center. We are dealing with an issue right now where uh, data from P2 is not flowing smoothly into RMS and vice versa. So we are working with P2 on that and, and well aware of that. Importing submittals. Uh, a lot of times, uh, well, a lot of times, on some contracts that I've seen, the government will go in and they will pre-fill out the submittal register for the contractor. Uh, and usually on in those cases, the government has a template that they use. You can download the template and pre-fill it out. Most of the time, though, the government's been using that same template for a long, long time. They go in and they fill out all the um, the, the, uh, the submittals for the contract. Note, very important. Note the import mode. It, by default, will overwrite what's there. Now, that's what most people want. But keep that in mind, if you go in later on and you import a submittal register with that default to overwrite existing submittals, you're going to wipe out everything that's inside of the contract. So you're going to want to choose merge. But 99% of the people doing the import submittal register, 99% of them will overwrite because that's what they want. They want to set a standard for the contract. And that's usually done early on in the contract. If you're doing this later on, it's rare, very rare. All right, same thing here. Uh, when you go to create a contract in RMS, we have the ability to cop copy information from another contract. Usually this is only for government people that create contract, you know, at the end of the fiscal year, they're adding a whole bunch of contracts to RMS. They can set a standard and copy that to a whole bunch of other contracts to make it go real quick to help save clicks and whatnot. Um, yeah, so most of you won't be using this feature. This, it, this involves copying data from one contract to another. Uh, exporting the list of changes. So this is used to get some of the data out in RMS. This is an old option that's been there for a long time. Not really gonna talk about that much. You can also export it out to clipboard to copy and paste that into something uh, something else. Specs intact. All right, so if you do use specs intact, you're one of the few contracts that use that, you know all about this. You can add the specs intact file and import that file. What's nice about RMS 3.0 is it, it keeps a history of the specs intact imports if you do more than one uh, say you do more than one, kind of like the SDEF file, by the way, when you do the SDEF import, um, uh, it will keep a history of all the all the SDEF imports that you do, which is kind of nice because before it didn't used to do that. And if you got to the point of no return, you could go back to an SDEF import that you know was good and start from there, right? Okay, we're gonna go through the closeout fairly quickly. Um, uh, as you all know, we had a CCB come in to have the contractor do some of the real property screens to set up uh, the 1354, uh, an, uh, an interim 5054, uh, 1354, sorry. So uh, some of these screens, um, you, th these are all from the government's perspective, right? This training is from the government perspective. Uh, the contractor can now go in and do some of the real property uh, lookups. Obviously, they can't do everything, right? Government's, uh, the contractor is not going to know the funding code or or some of the other stuff. So they can only set up an interim 1354, then you can take it from there and and, and finalize it, right? For the actual real property uh, uh, clo uh, close out. Um, let's see here. Yeah, all right, perfect. Uh, so uh, again, um, this is the real property screen, so you can fill this out. I'm, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because uh, those of you that put in this information, there's usually not a lot of questions on it. Um, and, and again, the contractor can do part of this. The, the whole idea of RMS, right, is to get the contractor to do as much data input as possible to save you guys from having to do the work. Um, and then you guys will approve that, modify it, change it, uh, sign it, send it off, right? Again, uh, like with a lot of modules on RMS on the top right hand corner, you can choose the uh, the interim report, I guess you could say, the DD 1354, you can click that to see what it looks like before you finalize it, just to make sure it looks the way you want. Because a lot of times when you're filling out all this information on RMS, you're wondering, 
does it look like what I need it to look like on the official form? Well, you can hit that button and that'll let you know. So continuing on, you can set up the deficiencies, the remarks. Uh, again, the way the remarks are, it totals all the, the data up a certain way. Um, and there's been a lot of requests to change how that total is totaled up. So if you have a question on that, please feel free to contact the RMS Support Center. That has changed quite a few times over the last handful of years. Um, yeah. All right. And again, there's a document package like, like usual. Um, you can also go to the contract reports and set up the reports uh, to run on the contract side. Again, you can, you can either search from most people will take uh, the search bar and search for a specific report and use that, or you can drag and drop the tile onto the group by if you so, if you so wish uh, and, and get the, the reports that way. All right. So same thing with the uh, 1149. You get to go in there, fill out all the information. Uh, once you once you get that all set up, uh, you continue on. Same thing with the 1149. You can run the the report before it's finalized to see what it looks like. Uh, this I believe is mostly for physical property going transferred from the contractor to the government at the end of the contract. Close out, by the way, is kind of a module in RMS that is. <coughs> excuse me, is not wide, widely used. So it's, it's not uncommon to have government people contacting us going, hey, I have a contract from five years ago that I need to process the closeout on. So, sorry, excuse me. If there's any questions, feel free to contact the Army Support Center. Again, every district has its own way of doing things. All right, I'm gonna put myself on mute real quick. I'll be right back. All right, there we go. All right, so, uh, CPARs, uh, RMS does not interface with CPARs anymore. So you, some districts still require this to be filled out, but a lot of districts do not put data in here uh, anymore. Uh, it all depends on your district. So, uh, but we do not interface with CPARs like we used to. I will leave that there and continue on. Okay. All right. Warranty tracking. Warranty tracking has had a pretty big change from 2.38. Of course, you can you can uh, elect to do specific inspections required at certain months. So you check the boxes and they will pop out a uh, document package that you can drag and drop um, documents into, scan documents of the warranty items, right? Uh, and they can be pictures, they can be PDFs, they can be whatever you want it to be, zip files. Uh, they, we do not accept all attachment types, but we do accept a lot of the common ones. If there's a specific program that you use that you wanna put into RMS, you can either zip it up or you can ask us to support that specific uh, uh, extension file type, right? Um, and we can deal with that. Obviously, uh, this is this is for the warranty. All right, very good. Yep, more information on what the warranty screens look like. Um, different districts use this very differently from, from each other. Any questions on the closeout import export um, warranty items? I will go on mute for a minute, I think. Yeah, we're at the last thing. So I will go on mute and let you guys ask any questions you'd like. Uh, I apologize for not giving you as much time as I, I promised, but uh, please feel free to ask questions. Unmute yourself and ask, and we'll do our best to answer them. Looks like we have a question from a user in the chat. It says, how about warranty calls and linking to the DD1354? So, so by warranty calls, I'm curious what you mean by that. So I know, um, when you say calls, are you talking like, Boz, maybe you can help me out with this one. Um, like when somebody makes a, like their warranty, they have an item they want to use as a warranty. So how do we link that and put that got it. in the DD1354 to track it? For like, like, a, like a warranty event. Yeah, right now, I don't think RMS has that ability. I know we've had a few people ask that in the past, uh, you know, to say, I, I'm actually, I'm actually utilizing it or, or, or uh, I forget what it was. Normally, warranty comes after the, the property has been transferred over to the user, so it really would not go on a DD1354. Ah, there you go. Thank you. So, is, is it, it's usually after the closeout process, right, Boz? Yes. Okay. All right. That makes a lot more sense now. All right. As, as you can there, tell, uh, there, there, could be a, a, there could be the occasions when the final 1354 is still outstanding. And a warranty item has come up, and that could be placed on the 1354 as a deficiency. Your, your district may do things differently. So, for example, one of the reasons why RMS has all the features it does is because we have District XYZ going in my district. 
I do warranty calls and I need to use RMS this way. And that needs to go to, um, I believe the CCB as a, as a feature request, and they can look at that and go, all right, how many people use this? Will this affect the uh, impact of the operation of RMS? Uh, and, and, and you can get that change in there. So, so th there's a lot of requests like, uh, like what you asked about, you know, it, our district does this, we'd like to track this in RMS. Can we change RMS to start tracking that? So you want, you want to set that up for, um, um, how, how your district does things go to the CCB for that 1 for, for the warranty stuff. I think when they were making those changes, most of the districts were just scanning documents in and dumping them into RMS, which of course, back in the 2.38 days, that was a painful process, right? Cause you had to use that map to C drive, pop that in there. So the biggest request we got for the warranty area was just put document packages there. We'll dump the data, the documents in there and use those for recording. So, so if, if you do want a specific change to the way the warranty items work, definitely contact your CCB. The CCB, the change request, uh, change control board is, is um, very active when it comes to how, you know, looks at all the requests, which is important, by the way. If, if you want a change, make sure you put your voice in there because those, those tally up and those ones that have all the votes tend to get the, the votes on them. How long do PCF files stay in storage before they are deleted or destroyed? So, from our message perspective, we we never delete or de destroy files. We we have been told we cannot. Uh, the data storage requirements for RMS are growing exponentially, and they are, uh, yeah, it's 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 getting to the point where it's it's amazing. It's, we're becoming a pretty big um, dot on the map when it comes to uh, storage requirements. So, from our perspective, data never dies. It's always there. From PCF's perspective, from what I understood, they they store that data forever as well. I'm, I'm, if I'm missing something, please let me let me know. Yeah, so for PCF side, we don't really, as for as RMS, we don't really track how long we keep that those documents. We just know that we upload to them. Right. That as well. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about progress and placement, as you guys um, have heard a little bit uh, from Paul and. The RMS contractor that uh, we're working on that, and right now, currently, headquarters have the Tiger team set up that is analyzing uh, progress and placement and how they want to have it, um, and how they want it to report, um, etc. Uh, and so, and what maybe new features or different types of functionality. So, um, while I know it sounds like we're sidestepping it a little bit we are actively working on it and um we'll, we'll definitely be having training videos and training material uh in the future with regards to the that specific topic so just fyi um it looks like we have another question here um since the previous ccb retired uh how does the district ccb how do they submit changes so uh actually the ccb is being revamped, um, there you can send them to RMS PMO. Um, so myself, um, if you have something that you wanted while it in the interim while it is being revamped, um, and then and then I can input that for you. Um, otherwise, when that uh, CCB member actually gets assigned, um, then you can have to talk to them on that specifically. Awesome. Are there any other questions? I'm going to stop sharing my screen because I can't see anything else on my, my window when I do that, but I'll still be here. So stop sharing. Uh, oh, yeah, I think uh, that gives us a wrap of that. I, we really appreciate everybody coming out and um, <clears throat> providing your questions and suggestions on what you'd like to see in training. All of that helps us um, give you better support. And with that, I will let you uh, wrap us up. Yep. Uh, I mean, that's all I had. Feel free to email me if you had any CCP items. I put my email in there. Know that we have an RMS YouTube channel. There's a lot of other items in there. Other than that, uh, have a good day. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.